Ephesians 1 and 22. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Chapter 4, please, in verse 15. But streaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Chapter 5, please. And verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Would you say amen to God's word? Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Keep your Bibles. We're going to be dealing with Ephesians 1, sharing some things there this morning. Some time ago, I, I began to preach and shared with you that I would be doing it over time, preaching my way through the New Testament to show how that Christ is revealed to us in each book. I didn't, because I have dealt with it so many times, I didn't spend so much time dealing with a portrait of Christ in the Gospels because I have, I have done that uh, a lot in the preaching of the church. But in Matthew, he's revealed to us as the king, and Mark as the servant, and Luke as the perfect man, John as the divine son of God. And then we preach to you in Acts how he is revealed as the resurrected Lord. In Romans, he is the end of the law for righteousness. And then Galatians, uh, we, we came to 1 Corinthians, rather, saw him as the wisdom of God. 2 Corinthians, we saw him as sufficient grace. And then we came to uh, Galatians, and we shared that message here not so long ago and dealt with him as the seed of Abraham. You may remember that. He is the seed of Abraham. And the next epistle in line in our, our New Testament canon and the order we find it is the book of Ephesians. And we're going to see him in Ephesians as being revealed to us as the head of the church. He is the head of of the church. Three times in this epistle he will mention that to us. And in chapter 1 we read in chapter 4 and chapter 5. In chapter 1 we see him as the governmental head. In chapter 4 we see him as a vocational head. And then in chapter 5 as the marital head. And uh, we're going to deal with each of those. And this morning I simply want to deal with the first one and talk about some things about Christ being the head of the church. He is the head of the church, not the Pope, not me, not Pastor Cardo. None of us are the head of the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. There's only one head. It's not a grotesque creature having two heads. It only has one head, and that head is Jesus Christ, and he is the sovereign head. He's an active head. He is not like some figurehead as we might would find in England where we have the Queen of England and, and, and she is seen somewhat as the head of England, but she's just a figurehead. Right. Parliament really rules the country and her authority is not one who really rules and governs the country. Christ is not a figurehead. He is the literal head Amen. of the church, the sovereign head that is over it with all power and all might. So there is somebody governing this body. There is somebody actively leading this body. If you're not to connected to Christ, you're not in the church. If you don't know Christ, you're not in the church. If you're not under his leadership, you're not in the church. If he's not actively guiding your life, you're not in the church, all right? But he is the head of the church. And if you don't see him as your head, you're not a part of him and you're not in the church. And I want us to, I want us to come to this, to see him revealed in Ephesians and to see him as an active head. So many times we see Christ as, as he's over there, he's out there, he's, he's kind of 
kind of that invisible spirit that's off somewhere in an imaginary land or some kind of fantasy land. But I want us to come to see him. As he said that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. That Christ is present with us and he lives and governs our life. The signals are sent from the head, from the brain, if you will, on the every part of the body. Every member of my body receives its instruction from the head, my, even down to my toes. And you and I are members one of another and members of the body of Jesus Christ. And we receive our instruction from the head. And if we're not listening to him, if we don't know his voice, if he's not guiding our life, then we're not seeing him as the head of the church. We've got to see that this church is not an effort of WPC. This church is not something that, that is the mayor work and architecture of men. But what's happening here today is something that's under the government and the leadership of the living Lord. Something that's under the headship of the one who sits at the right hand of God. He is actively involved in the affairs of our personal lives and our corporate life as a church that he is his body. And we must see that and I want us to understand it now. There's some ground here to cover. I want us to look please at Ephesians 1 and we're going to we're going to emphasize two things out of this passage. I want to make some comments in verse 22 and 23 and then back up in chapter 1 and emphasize some things of two things about his being the governmental head. We're going to see first of all a purpose. And, and, and this is going to become paramount through the epistle, but we're going to talk about this purpose that is involved in, in, in what he is doing and bringing things about. And then we're going to see his power that is being revealed and how it is done. Those two things. I'm going to tell you, is, is we're going to find a phrase that's found throughout Ephesians. You can read it several times. It'll say, according to, according to. And two things emerge from that. One of that is the purpose or the, or the will of God. And then the other is the power or the wealth of God. I will tell you, God's got a desire and a will. And he's got the ability to carry it out. First of all, you got to have a want to. First of all, if anything gets done in your life, there has to be a desire. Desire. And secondly, if anything gets done, there's got to be more than a desire. There has to be an ability and a functionality to carry out that desire and to accomplish it, a liberty to carry out that desire. It's not enough to have a desire. A lot of us desire things and never see it happen. A lot of us want things to happen in our life, but it never comes to pass because either one, there's no real power to carry it out, or the desire is not deep enough to carry it out, or there's no liberty to carry it out. But God has all of it. He has the desire to get it done. He has the design in which he's going to do it. And he's got the power to get it done and carry it out. And we're going to see that in this governmental head who is the head of the church. Now understand this as we, we see him coming and in verse 22. He makes this statement about Jesus Christ in Ephesians 1. And he hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Ah, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Understand that first of all, Jesus did not become the head of the church. And we look at this, we see how he became the head of the church. He is the head of the church as the God man. The church did not come to be until the day of Pentecost. It came into place. It was created out of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ and united to him. But this body of people could not be united to him until he had died as their substitution and died as the one of taking them there to Calvary. In that act on Calvary, then through the spirit of God he is able to create a body and to unite them with him and to be able to do his work in the church in this earth through a body of people through members if you will he is able to do that by the power of his Holy Spirit but all of that was dependent upon him becoming the God man he died he first of all came and became man and then in becoming man he lived the life that God wanted him to live 
He was obedient unto the Father all the way unto death. And the world said he's not worthy to live. The world said he's not fit to be a part of our society. The world treated him worse than a criminal. The world said, give us a thief and a murderer, but get rid of this healer. Get rid of this faith healer. Get rid of this promoter of new doctrines. And give us this one that, that is a thief and a robber. And they stayed with the old system rather than have life. They stayed with something that was decrepit and depraved instead of having something that was good and that was pure and holy. And as a result of that, they rejected him. But man doesn't have the last say in the matter. God looked down and said, I'm going to exalt him and I'm going to put him above every name and every power and every dominion and every principality. Every nation's going to be under him. Every angel's going to be under him. Every human will be under him. All of creation will be under him. All things will be placed under the feet of Jesus Christ and that he will be the governmental head of it all. And then he states about this new creature that has been made, the church. And he gave him to be the head of the church. Jesus did not become the head of the church by an election. He did not become the head of the church by default. He did not become the head of the church by inheritance. He became the head of the church by direct appointment. God has appointed him there. The one who is the sovereign creator has appointed that Christ should be the head. He's going to create this body of people and he's going to have a head for that body who is going to be the head of this body. None other than the risen Lord, our Savior. Savior Jesus Christ and he is the head of the church the Bible said he gave him it is his gift unto the church he is not a head that is a tyrant God did not give the church a head that's going to hold something over them in tyranny that's going to be some head that is careless and that is self-centered but this head is one who gave himself for the church this is the head who died for the church this is the head who loves the church and purchased it by his own blood and therefore he is worthy to lead it he is worthy to guide it because he made it and created it he is worthy to be the governor over it because he is the one by which it is possible for the church to come into existence and so as a result of that he is given unto us as our head and the gift that God has given us. And he says that we, this church then, is his body. It is not just some grotesque head, if you will, but we are this body now of Jesus Christ. And it says that the church is the fullness of him. Jesus Christ in all that he is doing in this world and the ministry that he began upon the earth and healing and reaching out and touching and and doing pre- Preaching and teaching and, and, and reproving and rebuking and calling men to repentance. All the work that he did in his body when he was up on this earth, he did it in that body. And he's doing it now in his body. But his body is now seen as the church. And you and I are members in particular of that body. We're the fullness of him. He only has one body. He's not doing this through the government. He's not doing this through the court system. He's not doing this to the United Nations. He's not doing this through the European Union. He is doing this through the church. He's doing it through those that have been purchased by his blood and that have been united to him by his Holy Spirit and are one with him. It's in that body that he is still reaching out and touch lives. It's through that body he will preach the gospel. He will not preach the gospel through the president or the Supreme Court. He will preach the gospel through a voice that has been birthed by his blood. He will preach the gospel through one who has been united unto him. We are his body and no other group has that privilege. Now, I want us to see then we're the fullness of him. We're the fullness of Christ. We're it. This local church, the church functions on two levels. Locally and universally. But only Christ sees the church universally. 
Only Christ can be working in a congregation over here and in a congregation over here and producing in each congregation that which he will unite when the church is brought together universally as the bride of Christ and seen visibly in the millennial reign. Only then will the church be seen on a universal level by the world so that we can see how of all God's processes have merged and brought these things together so that this part complements this part and what was being done in China was complementing what was done in America. And what was being done in America was complementing what was being done in Mexico. What was being done in Mexico was helping and bringing together with what's done in Tanzania or, or in some other nation, Sudan, or wherever it may be. Only Christ sees it on that level. I don't function on that level. I function on a local level. And you and I as a part of a local body, every local body is the function as a body of believers believers in Jesus Christ and that you and I must understand we are the fullness of him whether we are mature or immature he's not going to reach out in the world and do something through that world to promote his gospel we're it we're it and we've got to see that we are it and if we're deficient then it's deficient if we're not where we need to be then the work isn't going to get done but the church is the vessel there is no other vessel there is no other instrument there is no other body we are the fullness of Jesus Christ be us weak or be us strong be us believing or unbelieving we're it and we got to see that and you got to see that Christ is active you've got to see the one that you are the fullness of is the one that feels all in all we receive our fullness not from the government we don't receive our fullness from society. We don't receive our fullness from the intellectuals of our age. We receive our fullness from the one of whom we are his fullness. We are his expression. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are his nose. We are his knees. We are his feet, his hand, his toes, his elbows. We are the ones. And we've got to see that the one of whom we are the fullness, he is the one that feels. Only power, the only power that's going to move that hand is the power of Christ. The only power that's going to strengthen those feet is the power of Christ. We need no power outside of the one that feels him. We're not the fullness of the government. We're not the fullness of America. We're the fullness of Jesus Christ. We're not the fullness of a society. We're the fullness of Jesus Christ. And he is the one that fills us up to give us the power to do the work that he needs to do. Just as you feel your own body, Christ feels his. I feel me. F-I-L-L, not F-E-E-L. I feel me. Everywhere you touch me, you're touching me. You may just say, well, I just touched your finger. I don't care, you still touched me. All right? Touch my toe, you touch me. Because I identify with every part of my body. Yes, sir. And I, I don't, I'm not likely to give it up either. Yes, sir. I don't, I don't let my toes go real lightly. And when someone smashes them, I take offense at that. <laughs> yes, sir. Unless they needed smashing. If I had them in the wrong place, that's my stupidity, all right? But uh, if I keep them in the right place and, and someone smashes on purpose, they smash me. You ain't got to kill all of me to hurt me. All you got to do is just touch one part. That's why Paul said, Jesus told Paul, you're kicking against me. You're fighting against me. You just touched a few of my members, but you're touching my body. Let this world know again. It may be that they snuff out a voice here, and they snuff out a voice there. They shut down the church here. They shut down the church there. They haven't struck at a religion. They haven't struck at just some kind of societal movement. They have struck at the one that sits at the right hand of God. He is over all. He is the head of all. And he is the king that is our Lord. He fills his body. And if you touch any member of the body, you've touched him. Woo, glory to God. 
Now, Ephesians, I want us to back up now and see what's involved in now his purposes in arriving at this place of being this head. Chapter 1 and verse 10 summarizes for us what God is doing and what he is aiming at and where he is seeking to arrive. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now let's understand that verse, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, the word dispensation means management, administration, stewardship. We go back and begin in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. You know the story. Man's created. Man falls. God deals with man. He deals with him, first of all, in reference to his conscience. Man has a revelation of God. And, and he has a conscience that witnesses to, of, of God. There are no written commandments. There is no written scripture that's given unto him. And for the first, that will be the case for the first roughly 2,500 years of history. God will deal with man simply as he reveals himself and as he's imprinted his nature and morality on the conscience of that man. I've said it once, I'll say it again. Cain knew it was wrong to kill Abel. He didn't need a book to tell him that. He didn't need some stone monument with the commandments. That's what I'm telling you. This nation can't seem to get in their thick skull. I don't care if you take it off of every monument in America. I don't care if you erase it from the Supreme Court of the United States. You're never going to get rid of that conscience. You're never going to get rid of that voice that's going to echo inside of you and say, say you're wrong. Ah, you can take it out of the stone. You can erase it from the books. You can take it out of the schools, but you'll never remove it from your spirit. You'll never get it out of that place. And God has said, put it because you are made in the image of God. And you're never going to escape it. Never going to escape it. For 2,500 years, God will guide men through his voice and their conscience and speak to them and they will know, they will have a sense of morality. There will be law codes and that will be developed. The code of Hammurabi predated the law of Moses. It was a Babylonian king and he had all of these codes. It was, uh, and out of that came that first idea of, or, or very strongly seen in that is that principle uh, that is known as an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, a sense of equal justice. And they, they sought to establish laws based on equality. Some of those laws were good, some of them were bad. But at the heart of that, uh, it's says that man without having scripture had within him a sense of morality. He didn't learn it from a cow. He didn't get it from an ape. He didn't get that through some evolutionary process. It was imprinted on his nature. And man was making laws before God ever gave the written law at Sinai. Man was writing down things that were wrong and determining justices and injustices. And it's amazing how much of the code of Hammurabi is on par with the scripture. And with the teaching of Moses, not all of it is, but a, a fair portion of it is in, in line with what was taught with Moses. But the thing that law that God gives to Moses is really not something new. It's an expression of what God's already been doing for the first 2,500 years of history. He's been administering things to the ages. He's trying to bring this thing somewhere. He's managing all of this and bringing men to hear his word, obey him, bringing them out of nations administering his word and bringing things somewhere to a point. He's been administering the times, the ages, from the age of conscience. When the law comes to the, to the time of law and then Calvary comes and then Pentecost and now this 
age of bringing out of the Gentiles a people for his name and the church. Nations are still coming and going. Kings are still rising and falling. People, so civilizations are still rising and they're still falling. There's still wars and rumors of wars. It looks like things are, are just not going anywhere and it's all going to fall apart. There have been things that we would have thought, there have been times in the history of man we thought all was a loss. We thought when Hitler and his machine comes across Europe and it's all going to be gone. But Hitler didn't take it out. Oh, and that wasn't due to the great greatness of America that was done to the administration of a sovereign king who was over all a sovereign God who has been working through the ages and you don't see his hand always visibly but I'm telling you right now he is steering this thing on a course he is going somewhere with humanity and he's got an aim and a purpose So in the dispensation of the fullness of times, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, whether in heaven or in earth. First of all, gather together in one. That's one Greek word. What does that mean? It means to bring back and gather around a central point. If you have a speaker... And he brings his message. Many times at the conclusion of his message, he will sum up his message and gather all of the points he's made around the one central point that he was seeking to get across. In other words, there was a central aim. And he was bringing out all of these points in his message in order to get to the central point. And so he sums that up at the end so that you remember his central theme that he was after. And he sums it all up to bring it and gather it around that one point. And he says he's going to do this summing up. He's going to do this gathering around in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ becomes the vehicle by which God is going to sum it up and bring it all around one point. Where has he been aiming at? I'll tell you what. In the beginning, God made us in his image and he made us to reflect him. He made us to be an agent and an instrument through which his glory, his grace, his might, his, his holiness could be expressed through our nature where God could express the love God could express his ability God could express his, his graciousness and his kindness God could express his wonder and his glory through this man and through this woman but man severed the relationship and broke it off but what God has been doing through the ages is bringing back man unto himself he's been gathering it back around him God has been reconciling man unto himself. How are we going to get back to God in Jesus Christ? How are we going to get back to our original purpose in Jesus Christ? How are we going to get back to the original design in Jesus Christ? He's going to sum it up. He's going to bring it around so that it gathers around one, around himself and he's going to do that through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Glory. It didn't matter everything. The whole world has got out of sync. Everything's out of order. Nothing seems to be going the direction that God intended it to go. Or at least I should say as he designed it to go. He designed for marriage to be between a man, one man, and one woman. And it's not going that way. It's gotten out of order. He designed for men to express certain characteristics about himself, his leadership, his sacrifice, his sense of dignity and honor and responsibility, his sense of being able to bear the load and the burden. He placed that in the man. He wanted that man to reflect that ability to bear and suffer and to sacrifice and to lead and to guide and to demonstrate his authority. 
He wanted that woman to, to uh, reflect his tender caress, his tender embrace, that sensitivity that God has towards, oh my, towards mankind. As a mother, he can take us up into his arms and gather us into his bosom and nobody can be as tender as the God that you and I serve. There is no voice so authoritative and yet no voice so tender. There is no voice so strong and yet no voice so smooth and soft that it can break the hardest of hearts and yet so authoritative and it can move the biggest of rocks. It doesn't matter. That's the voice of God. And he wanted it to demonstrate to the man. And he wanted it to demonstrate to the woman. And he made us that way. But we've left off God's design. That's right. Amen. Things there that need to be emphasized. But another time. Another time. God has got an order in the home. He's got an order in the church. He's got an order in the world. He's got an order in humanity. And everything since the fall has been out of order. Man has tried to bring order out of chaos, but chaos continues in the world. Man has made every effort at peace, and yet peace has not persisted. (laughs) Amen. Except that there was one who came, and he came and revealed what man really should be. He revealed how that man should live under pressure. He revealed how that man can demonstrate godly traits in an ungodly world. He demonstrated manliness. And yet, though he was a man, there was in him a a, a sense in which women were attracted to him. They were not attracted to him romantically. They were attracted to him and that they saw in him their fulfillment. He was a man's man and a lady's man, but I don't use that in the sense of some kind of romantic fulfillment. A man could look at him and say, that's how I want to live. That's how I want to act. I want to be that kind of man. I want to demonstrate that kind of fortitude. I want to demonstrate that kind of sacrifice. I want to demonstrate that kind of commitment. I want to demonstrate that gentle spirit. I want to demonstrate that authority. That is an authority that gives and is not there to take. I want to demonstrate that firm resolve and that conviction in God and the faith that that man demonstrates. And then a woman can look at him and say, I want to be like him. I want to demonstrate his submission. I want to demonstrate his care. I want to demonstrate his concern. I want to demonstrate his gentle nature. I want to demonstrate how he can take a child in his hand and lay his hand on him and bless him. And the children are drawn. I want to demonstrate his motherly instincts. I want to be like Jesus. All of humanity can find their fulfillment and completion in him. Amen. And there's no romantic attraction. It's all an attraction that is spiritual. It's an attraction that is dignified and honorable. And he demonstrated that order. You look at Jesus and he walked according to a different tune. He didn't march by the world's standards. He didn't march on the world's schedule. He didn't live by the world's principles. The Pharisees would have him do one thing. He did another. The crowds would call him over here. He went over there. Ah, the demons were tired to push him over there. He pushed them where he wanted to push them. Yes, sir. He was just that way. If he wanted to go to the temple, he'd go when he wanted. His brother said, why don't you go now? It's not my time. They wanted to kill him at this time. It's not now. He didn't die till he's ready to die. He doesn't cleanse the temple till he's ready to cleanse it. He doesn't heal till he's ready to heal. He doesn't cast out a demon till he's ready to cast it out. He prays when he wants to pray. He walks where 
where he wants to walk. He goes where he wants to go. And it's all in accord with the Father's design. He's only went where Father has sent him to go. There's an order in his life. There's a control. There's a dignity. There is something about him that is peaceful and is right and is succinct and is in line with what God wants us to be. And he brings, you know the story, he brings people. What God now does, there's this phrase that we're going to find in Ephesians. And throughout the New Testament, Paul uses it most frequently. Because Christ now did it. He becomes our substitute, but he becomes more than our substitute. He did things for us. He dies for us. He bears our sins to Calvary for us. He wins the victory over the devil for us. He, he brings redemption. He brings restoration. He brings healing. He makes provision for us. All of those things he has done for us. But none of that is available to me unless I am willing to be united to him. Jesus Christ is not a candy store that you walk in the door and pick out a piece of candy that delights you and then walk out and live your life as you want to live it. He's not a buffet where you march down the line and pick and choose the parts you want to put on your plate and go sit down and have the dinner as you designed the dinner to be. It's not that way. It's an all or nothing thing. He didn't just do it for me. There became a sense in which he became my scapegoat. I went with him. He took me with him. When he died, I was with him at the cross. I was there and he rose from the dead. I was there. When he ascended to the right hand, I was there. Not in some literal sense, but in a vicarious sense. He took me with him. And now if I will have his grace, if I will have his blood, if I will have his power, I can only have it when I'm willing to be attached, when I'm willing to be placed in Jesus Christ. Only when I'm a part of the body can I know the blessing of God. People want to receive from Christ, but they don't want to be in Christ. Or they're enveloped by him. So there is this summing up in the management of the ages. He is gathering everything together around one, around himself. And he's doing that in Christ. So that if you will be reconciled and gathered around God, you got to be in Christ. That's it. The only place of redemption and salvation is in Christ. Not by Christ or beside Christ. Not so much with Christ, but in Christ. You must become your living quarters, your dwelling place he must become your atmosphere. He must become the air you breathe. He must become the thing you live for. He must become your all and your all in Christ. Glory to God. Christ in me and me in Christ. As I've said before, I need air around me and I need air in me. And if you take either one away from me, I'm not going to live. I need air in me to live and I need air around me to live. And in order for the saint to live, he's got to have Christ in him and he's got to be in Christ. No other way. I got to draw from him and I got to let him live through me. I've got to let his power come through me and I've got to be able to take what I've got and give it unto him and surrender to Jesus Christ. And let's look at this process in some more detail. So he's summing it up. In Christ, he's bringing everything together back to its original design. All of creation, God-centered. What about those that die and go to hell, Brother Woods? 
that group itself has a place in displaying the glory of God. And they will glorify his justice and judgment. And they that refuse to be reconciled to him will be cast out and separated from society. The place itself will be called the lake of fire in its place, but the nature of it is eternal death. Whereas those that have been gathered around him that will live in the earth where he has designed them to live will be in the place called eternal life. Life or death. Separated from God or united from God. When Adam sinned and Eve sinned the entire world. You got to see that just for a moment, all right? The entire world because they were the world. Every one of us got kicked out of the garden in Adam. There's this place in Hebrews where the Lord speaks about Levi. It said that Levi paid tithes in Abraham, but Levi wasn't born. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, but Levi was in the loins of Abraham, if you will. He would be a part of his seed. And God saw that there was a blessing that would come to Levi because his father paid tithes into Abraham. And there was a, a corporate sense of that. There was a judgment that came to Abraham that affected Levi because of something that Abraham did. And there was something that Adam did in the garden that affected every one of us. God kicked all of us out of the garden. None of us had the privilege of being born in Eden. None of us had the privilege of seeing the the tree of life. We have all been born into a godless, degenerate, sinful world surrounded by sin and a world where the tempter has got full access to drive men away from God and to draw them away. We got kicked out of that garden. But God did that for a reason because when he condemned the world in one man and he kicked everybody out in one man he's going to bring them all back in through one man and that one man is Jesus Christ we don't have to have individual saviors there's one head there's one head and his name is Jesus Christ so In this administration, he's bringing it together. Bear with me here just a little longer. Ephesians 1, look. Let's see how this is. He's done this and brought this to pass. Begin at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Where? In Christ. That's where these blessings are. They're not in the world. They're not in Muhammad. They're not in Joseph Smith. They're not in T.D. Jakes. They're not in Dan Woods. They're in Jesus Christ. So God has blessed us with blessings. I like that. He's blessed us with blessings. But spiritual blessings they are. These are not so much temporal blessing. But I I have found that many times the temporal witnesses to me of a spiritual. Oh yes, God has been good to me temporally. He has given me things. He has blessed me with strength and health and, and food and clothing. And in that I still find spiritual goodness and spiritual graces that God has bestowed upon me because those very things point to to his providential care but he has blessed us with spiritual blessings uh, those blessings uh, that reach further than the visible those blessings uh, that will change your nature those blessings that take you from being somebody mean uh, to somebody who is kind uh, those blessings uh, that 
that rid you of your anger, those blessings that rid you of your bitterness, uh, those blessings uh, that make you a person that others can live with. Uh, oh, yes, those blessings uh, that make you a delight to be with instead of somebody who wants to be shunned. Uh, those blessings uh, that give you peace, uh, those blessings that give you strength, uh, those blessings that give you confidence, uh, those blessings that give you a purpose for living, uh, those blessings uh, that reach in and empower you uh, when the body is falling apart, uh, your purpose and resolve uh, remains fixed. Uh, when the world has lost hope, uh, your hope is like an anchor. Your hope is like an anchor and you press ahead. Uh, when the worlds around you have fallen at your side, uh, you keep on marching because you've got something on the inside that has touched your spirit and has brought you to a new level of living. We live life on a different plane. Our blessings are in high places. Yeah. Heavenly places, he says. <laughs> Woo! Our blessings aren't here. That's a problem with this world's theology. They're seeking for everything here. Our blessings are on a higher plane. And he's blessed us with these. Many times we count our blessings and we simply still point to the physical. Count the spiritual ones. Count your joy. Count your love. Count your patience. Count your inward faith. Woo, hallelujah. And he says, according as he hath chosen us in him. Again, we're going to see this phrase, in Christ, in him. So he's blessed us with these blessings in Christ. I'm just trying to bring this out in a simple way of explaining these verses. He's given us all these spiritual blessings. Blessings in the spirit. And he's given, us to them, given them to us in Christ. That's where you get them from. You got to get in Christ. And then he says, according as he has chosen us. He tells us that our being in Christ is not random our being in Christ is not by chance or accidental he picked us he hand picked you he reached down where were you Virginia and Virginian chose John Hooten he reached down where were you North Carolina yeah he reached in North Carolina and picked you he picked you where? Can I see? Louisiana. Louisiana. Ooh, God even goes to Louisiana. <laughs> Man. Glory. <Shh>, hallelujah. <laughs> Can anything good come out of Louisiana? <laughs> Amen, it can. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He went to the most foremost breaches of the earth and he chose you and he individually called you. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Oh, I'm telling you, sometimes we forget this, this sovereignty of God. That is not something that, that should lead me to say, oh, well, I'm picked, I'm in. I ain't got to worry about anything else. Let me go live my life. No, that picking me puts a fear in me yeah. puts a sense in me what an honor Amen. my what a call what a sovereign yeah. God what a care what a love yeah. what do I owe him for that I owe him my life I owe him my devotion yeah. and if he picked me he can bring me through yeah. if his hand yeah. called me he can deliver me yeah. if he brought me out he can bring yeah. me in yeah. if he gave me life yeah. he can sustain the life yeah. that he gave me Hallelujah, hallelujah. We shouldn't see the sovereignty of God as an excuse to live a haphazard life. Amen. We should see the sovereignty of God as an inspiration to be faithful and to love and to serve God with every ounce of devotion that we have. Amen. He's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. It's hard for us to grasp. No, it's not hard. It's impossible for us to grasp the foreknowledge, the omniscience of God. You can't, we can't even predict the weather. Yeah. That's right. 
I can't even tell you what's going to happen in the next 60 seconds, on, let alone the next 60 million years. Right, yeah. I, I can't do that. And we look down and we, and folks just confuse this thing and twist it all up and say, you know, you're predestinated. We are predestinated. Right. We are chosen. Right. Come on. But it's according to foreknowledge. Mm-hmm. Right. It's not according to random picking. Right. Right. It's not according to some kind of chance choosing by God whereby he just stabs in the dark and grabs the one here and grabs one there. Oh, come on. Woo! Before you were ever in the world, before he ever said, let there be light, before he ever said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, before he ever said, let the earth bring forth creatures, before he ever said, let there be a sun or a moon, before any of that occurred, he is able to have a vision that goes down and sees a Jeff Amos that will surrender to truth. Glory to God. That when the gospel is preached and truth is impressed on his heart, that man will respond to me. That man will come to me. Ah, he will be lost, but I'll bring him in. I'll bring him back to me. I'll reconcile him unto myself. I'm going to call him and choose him. Amen. Yeah. He not only saw Jeff Amos, he saw all of the processes that would produce a Jeff Amos. He saw your family. He saw your papa born in West Virginia. He saw that redheaded fella that grew up in the same place. He saw all of the processes that would be going in the nation yes. yep. that would happen at every time and would produce Ooh, glory to God yeah. see I don't operate like that no. God operates outside of time he's not bounded by time he doesn't operate Amen. inside the clock right. he sits the Bible said in Isaiah he inhabits eternity yeah. Woo. He literally dwells in eternity. He dwells in a timeless position. He's not bounded by the clock. He's not limited by seconds and minutes and hours and days. I am measurable. He is immeasurable. I can count my life in years. He has no years. I can count my life in seconds. He has no seconds. I can measure me in feet and inches. He is beyond measure. He feels all things. He contains all things. He is beyond the measurement of mankind. I don't live outside of time. I don't see all the processes that will bring me to glory. I don't know what my tomorrow holds. So I have to know the one who holds it. Amen. I don't know where America's going. Yeah. So I need to know the one who does. I don't know how to build the church, but I know the one who does. I don't know where he wants WPC tomorrow, but I know the one that does. And that is my security. Amen. Hallelujah. In him. You see, I am in time. I had a beginning. He had none. And so I measure things. I make choices. And sometimes I see how things are working to produce a result. And sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm just making choices on a daily basis, doing the things I know I need to do that God's called me to do. I'm praying, I'm studying, I'm dealing with the challenges that are before me. I've got a vision to grow, but I'm having to deal with things. But I'm not certain, I don't know 
how all of those processes, who's going to be saved and who's going to make it and who's not. And since I don't possess that knowledge, I reach out. God doesn't give me that knowledge. I preach the gospel to everybody. I preach it to everyone. I don't know who's going to receive it. I don't know who's going to reject it. But I'm going to challenge everyone that if they've got a chance to hear it, then they can be called of God and they ought to lay hold of it. If God gives you the privilege of hearing the gospel, you ought to embrace it and love him. Amen, amen. What a privilege. Yeah. Thank you, And just because God knew you mm-hmm. doesn't mean that He made you to make those choices. No. no. His knows. knowledge of you is not what determined your choice. Mm-hmm. That was your personal response. It just happens He knew your personal response. Yeah. Right. Amen. Whew. Amen. I'm telling you right now. You say, ah, oh, that's just it. And there's some that tell us, oh, God doesn't know all that. He doesn't know it till you choose it. I don't want a God like that. I don't want a God that doesn't know me. What if he might pass me by, Brother Bobby? Because he doesn't know what I'm going to do. He might just pass me by. But because he knows what I will do, he will ensure that I hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because he knows where I'm going to be. And he knows how to get me there. Glory to God. And you see, I can't measure all of this. I can't take all of that in. But that's why I take my life and I put it under the hand that is bringing it all together. I put my life and say, you got I don't know where this trial is supposed to bring me at, but you know where it's supposed to bring me at. I don't know where I fit in the scale of things on the universe, but I'll put my hand in the hand of the one who says, I can get you there. I've got a design. I'm going somewhere. Follow me. Follow me where I'm going. We need to restore the church to his leadership. The churches in America have taken the headship away from Christ. And they're designing a church that looks nothing like the church ought to be. We need to give it back to Jesus. Glory. Mm. I finish this verse. I'll quit. He says, according as he has chosen us in him. Before the foundation of the world. So you're going to be in Christ, but in what state? That you should be holy and without blame before him in love. Wow. What a power pack statement. So God has chosen you. And he's chosen you in Christ. Your calling is going to come through Christ. Your choosing is coming through Christ. Your place is going to be in Christ. Your molding is going to be in Christ. Your making, your shaping is going to be in Christ. Your entire life is going to be wrapped up in Christ. What's going to be the end product of that? The end product is that you're going to be before him. You're going to stand before him. You're going to be brought before him. Oh, glory. And there you are before God. But how am I going to look to him? Holy and without blame. Holy, oh my, holy and without blame. Oh, if I am never holy in your eyes, let me be holy in God's eyes. Ah, If I am never without blame to you, but let me be without blame to God. And there is no more just judge than he. There is no more righteous judge than he. And God will not have a guilty people stand before him. He will not have a beleaguered, doubtful people. He will have a people victorious whose natures are true, whose lives are right, who have been reconciled under his holy character. They will be blameless before the tribunal of his glory. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to wind up standing before God and he says, you have no charges against you. Welcome in to eternal life. Amen. 
Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Oh, glory to God. You are clean, you are washed, and you are holy. Oh, hallelujah. Let the blood flow. Let the blood flow from Calvary and wash us afresh. And let us put our confidence in the lordship and the righteousness of Christ to bring us through to such a state. But all of that holiness and blamelessness, blamelessness has been produced not in an atmosphere of law and regulation, but in an atmosphere of love. That's what he said. Holy without blame before him in love. Woo, glory. So that the holiness we lived out in this world, the virtuous lives we lived in the midst of an unvirtuous world, the separated lives we lived in a world that was filled with wickedness. Amen. That life of purity that we lived in the midst of impurity. That life of devotion that we lived in the midst of unfaithfulness. Oh, that when we get to God, we don't look at Him and feel hard at Him because we missed out on something. Oh, it was terrible. Well, if you knew what I had to do, go through it just to get here. If you knew what I had to get rid of just to get here. If you knew what I had to give up just to get here. If you knew what I had to lay down just to get here. When we get there, we're pure. We're separated from the world. We're free from sin. We're unstained by all the world's methods and mindsets. We're unstained by that self-centered mind. And when we stand there, we're loving every minute of it. And we say, God, all of this is possible because you love me and I love you. And this is where I want to be. I want to live in holiness the rest of my life. I'm not doing this to get to heaven. I want all of the earth to live like I live. I want the world to live where I live. Hallelujah. Woo! Read the false religions, their idea of heaven is simply heaven is nothing more than An extension of Earth's fantasy. There they can get a harem. There they can have a playground. There they can have their hunting ground in the sky. There they can reach out and come to some place of nothingness. Heaven becomes a place of self fulfillment instead of Christ fulfillment. But heaven for us is nothing more than a continuation of what's already been given and done to us. I'm not looking for a place where indwells sin. I'm looking for a place where indwells righteousness. <laughs> I'm not looking for a place where I can sin and get by. I'm looking for a place where folks don't want to sin. I'm not looking for a place where I can give in to temptation and not feel guilty. I'm looking for a place where there'll be no temptation. <laughs> I'm not looking for a place where I can agree with the devil and nobody know it. I'm looking for a place where there is no devil. Glory to God. I'm not looking for a harem. I'm looking for a place where men love one another and treat them well. I'm looking for a place where men act like Jesus acts. Oh, glory. Give me a place that's filled with the presence of a holy God. Stand to your feet this morning. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb of God. Woo! Glory. Hallelujah. 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 
I've only scratched the surface this morning, I promise you. But I'd like you to leave here today with this. The church has a head by design and not by default. By purpose, not by accident. He was appointed to that position. He's active. And he is putting everything through his process. And he's gathering it all together in him. He's going to reconcile all things to himself. He's going to sum it all up. He's going to sum it up in one word, one man. What does God want out of creation? Jesus. That's it. Your fulfillment is in Jesus. Your family's fulfillment is in Jesus. This church's fulfillment is in Jesus. And I want you to go home with this to begin to see. We'll talk about it more. I want you to begin to try to just fathom for a little bit that all the processes that have went in just to producing a you. And that God is aware of all of those processes. And he's working in all of it to produce the you that he wants to produce. You're not here accidentally today. Us being together is not accidentally. You being my friend, me being your friend is not accidental. These are the processes that God is using (laughs) to bring us to be summed up in him. (laughs) Woo, glory. And we want to wind up in one status, holy and without blame, with a heart full of love. Glory to the Lamb of God. (laughs) Hallelujah. Don't get angry at the processes. Don't get discouraged at the processes. Don't get distraught at the processes. Trust the engineer. Trust the head. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Give your life to the head. Give your life to the head. Woo! Oh, glory. Oh, glory. Mm. You only have one requirement to meet. Are you under the Lordship of Jesus Christ? And are you where he wants you to be? That's all you ever have to worry about. You're not in charge of tomorrow's activity. You have simply been charged with faith and obedience to a sovereign head. Woo, glory. I don't like where my family is. I don't like what's happening in my home. I don't like where this is going. Well, talk to the sovereign head to see if it's changeable. Glory. If it's not, then say, God, then produce in me what you want to produce through it. But this I know. I'm going to remain holy to you. And I'm going to keep my life in you that I may be free from sin. And sin's not going to get a hold of me. And I'm going to keep a heart full of love. And I'm going to let you guide and dictate the circumstances of my life. And when I get to the end, I'll see it all. Hallelujah. And I'll give you glory and honor and praise. But there's one thing I do. I trust you. You're the head. You're the head of the church. You're the head of my life. Praise God. Glory. 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 Glory.
tu cosita, mamá. now lift your hands to heaven give your life again let your life be given afresh to the head tell him tell him I want to see you as the head I want to see you as my head I want to see you as my governor I want to ever be conscious of your government in my life I want to be conscious Lord that you are the one engineering the processes and I want to respond to the processes rightly I want to do God what's right hallelujah I surrender, Lord, to your headship. I surrender this church afresh to your headship. I don't know where to take it, but you do. I don't know where it needs to be tomorrow, but you do. I don't know, God, what we need to look like in Washington, but you do. I don't know, God, how to reach this city, but you do. I don't know what it's going to take to break the hearts, but you do. And I trust you, God. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you, God. I trust you, Lord. Hallelujah. I trust you today. Woo! Glory. Hallelujah. 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 Woo!